on any given day. We have many reasons to praise the Lord, and today is no exception, the blessing of being in his house. But one thing for which we can always praise him is his faithfulness. Whatever else is going on in the world today, what's going on in our lives, no matter what, God is faithful. And we sing that now, great is thy faithfulness. standing with your Bibles open to our scripture for today and that comes from the Gospel of John chapter 19 reading verses 28 through 30 and thank you so much for uh, your energy in singing this morning that's a song that uh, you really can't be uh, relaxed about God's faithfulness is so precious and so scriptural and so are these words that we read from the gospel of john chapter 19. after this jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled saith i thirst 
Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Thank the Lord for his word. You may be seated. And it is our joy to greet you and to welcome you this morning. We're getting back into the Lord's house and getting back into worship. And I trust that uh, more people are feeling comfortable about coming and uh, joining us, worshiping with us. And uh, I just say to you, just share with people about your comfort level and, and uh, let them know that it's okay uh, to be in the Lord's house. Uh, hopefully we are getting to that place where we can worship freely and worship with our entire church family being present with us. Uh, we're only two weeks away from Easter and you know what a celebration that is and uh, we trust that will be a milestone for some who will uh, have it desire in their heart uh, to worship with us uh, that Sunday and then each and every Sunday following. It is good to welcome those who are joining us by Facebook and YouTube. We said before, this is a ministry that began at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, as far as I know, it's a ministry that will continue until Jesus comes. Uh, we have no idea of uh, discontinuing this. And, and it's good to hear from people who watch uh, by Facebook some who live outside of the area, indeed even outside of the state, uh, to know that they are part of our church family, though they may not be physically here. Perhaps one day that will happen, but until it does, uh, if they can't get here, we're glad to get to them. It's good to worship this morning, and, and uh, as we begin, we want to do what we must always do and begin what we must always begin as we bow together. Father, it's good to be in your house this morning. We look around us and we count our blessings. Indeed, they are greater than we can number, the greater than we can even name. But we know that every perfect gift has come from the Father of light. So thank you, Father, that regardless of what we have, or from whence it came, we know that ultimately it came from your hand, and we thank you for that. Being in your house today is one of those blessings. It's a privilege and an honor to be here, and we just thank you most of all, even as we welcome those who have come to worship. Most of all, Lord, today we welcome you because you're here in the person and power and presence of the Holy Spirit, and we thank you for that. We ask you to lead us, guide us, direct our thoughts, our hearts, prepare our hearts for what you have prepared for us. And whatever is done, we'll be quick to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> ask our sanctuary choir, worship team to come and share with us this song. And this morning we have some special guests who are joining the choir and as they come we'll get uh, Sherry to introduce uh, our guest singers and there's quite a story uh, behind them being here today and we are, we're just happy. I wasn't sure if uh, at the beginning if this was supposed to have been a surprise or not. If it was, it didn't last very long. Uh, I found out by the middle of the week, and so sure, you can take the Omni and introduce uh, the girls if you would, and tell how they got here. <laughs> Good morning. I'd like to introduce to you our granddaughters, we have Alexis, Keelan, Regan, and Braylon. And the way this came about is um, it when the Phyllis gave us the CD, when we first sang this song, I have it in the car. And so I started playing it. Well, the girls fell in love with it. So every time they would ride with me, they would say, Grandma, put that song in. So we started doing that. And in addition to that and singing it in their own church, 
um, to listen to them sing that song in the back seat just brought tears to my eyes. And I'm hoping that they're going to sing today just like they do in the car. <laughs> 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 that the shy car doesn't, doesn't set in. So last Saturday, I picked them up to um, take them home. And between Opal and Stephen City, we sang the song seven times. So <laughs> they should be ready. <laughs> Thank you, Sanctuary Choir, and just so you all know, we weren't overlooking you all, but today you just happened to, you just happened to get lost in the chatter. That's okay. That's quite all right. That's quite all right. We just appreciate our 
uh, worship team, new members and former members, no matter to us, we appreciate them, the worship team, so much. There are pastors who have, at years past, in years past, started seven weeks prior to Easter preaching through the seven sayings of Jesus Christ from the cross. I can't say that I have ever done that, but I have preached at least two uh, of those scriptures uh, at one time or another. And I would like to think that in uh, any given year, I would have preached a sermon before Easter about one, at least one of the seven sayings from the cross. I'm not going to guarantee that. And if you care to go back and check the record, that's fine with me. But I will tell you that there is so much that happened in that week before the resurrection that there are volumes to preach. And when we really think about the happiness of Easter, you cannot escape the horror of Good Friday. You have to remember that before the crown, there was a cross. And we dare not skim over the events that took place in the week prior to that, and especially what happened on that Friday. When the Lord was crucified that day, in the hours that he hung on that cross, he uttered seven words or seven statements. And as Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, we should not live a step beyond the cross. We must always live in the shadow of the cross. And the first words out of our Savior's mouth that day was a prayer. As a matter of fact, three of his sayings were a prayer. And the first one, interesting enough, was the fact that he wasn't praying for himself, he was praying for others. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Right after that, he says to a dying thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then, in the course of time, he looked down at his mother and said, woman, behold thy son. Immediately after that, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the fifth word, the fifth saying out of his mouth that day was two words, I thirst. And then he echoed that shout of victory. It is finished. And then the scripture says in his last words, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And so on that cross that day, the Lord had something to say that carried weight with everyone who has ever listened to him. We have to understand that the cross of Christ is not a pageant and it is not a play. To be sure, there have been pageants and there have been plays portraying what took place at Calvary. But I'm telling you, that day was not a play and it wasn't a pageant. It was punishment and it was torture and it was pain. And we dare not regard it anything less than it is. And so why other than the Lord leading did I choose these words today? When the Lord uttered from that cross these two words, I thirst. And when he made that statement, he wasn't making a request. He was simply stating a condition. He was simply saying what was happening at that particular moment. And the amazing thing is that we listen to him say that and we think, how can that possibly be? How can the one who identified himself as the living water now have to say, I thirst? How can the one, after all, he carved out the oceans and the lakes and he really channeled the rivers with the refreshing water 
down through the earth. We know that he made provisions to store away some springs under the earth, the most refreshing water you can ever find that will come from them. We know that in the Garden of Eden, he watered the garden with a mist. We know also that he was the one who controlled the clouds and let the rain come upon the earth. He was the one who unleashed the rain from above and from beneath that for 40 days it flooded the earth in the day of Noah. We know that he is the same God who can close up the cloud as he did in the day of Elijah. And for three and a half years, there was no rain. We know that he is the one who on Mount Carmel made sure that whereas on any other day and any other time, water would put out a fire. On this particular day, fire consumed the water. We know that on one occasion, he suspended the law of gravity and an ax head actually floated in the water. We know that God designed that water be H2O, two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. But on one occasion, he changed the chemistry composite of it and turned the sea into blood. We know that our Lord in the New Testament graced the waters of the Jordan River by being baptized there. And the first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee, he turned the water into wine. And then that wasn't enough. When the disciples were terrified beyond compare, at a storm at sea, our blessed Lord spoke the words, peace be still, and turned the raging sea into a calm sea, the waters of which you could hear the whisper of a morning. And so the one who has done all of that, the one who is the master of water, the one who has used it, the one who has created it, is now saying, I thirst. And we have to ask ourselves, how can that possibly be? In order to understand that, we have to appreciate the events that have taken place. It all began, if you want to mark a beginning, in the upper room with his disciples with that last meal. Broken bread and drinking the cup, sharing that meal with them. And then he moved on to the Garden of Gethsemane where he will shed sweat drops as blood, spending time there agonizing that God's will be done, not my will, but thine be done. Father, if it be any way possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thine be done. And then in the, that same garden, a traitorous friend, traitorous friend, and a mob of soldiers come and arrest him. They take him into... Pilate's Hall, and for the entire night, for all intents and purposes, he's bounced around between Pilate and Caiaphas and Herod. And it would have to be an upgrade to even call it a kangaroo court. It wasn't even that much. It was a mockery of anything resembling justice. And by morning time, he had been mocked and scorned and beaten beyond recognition. And in the middle of the morning, he was forced with what was left of that broken and beaten body to take a wooden beam and haul it up a rugged road to a place where he would be nailed to that cross with what was left of his body. And on that cross, he uttered those seven sayings. Three of them were spoken before noonday. But then at noonday, something interesting happened, something that had never happened before. Total darkness set in over the earth. Make no mistake about it, it wasn't just sort of dark, it was totally dark. It would be enough that it would choke you if you could inhale it. And so it does seem like when that darkness came, the crowds began to thin out. And in that time on that cross, we know that our Lord, the scripture says in Mark chapter 15 and verse 23, that someone attempted to put a drug, really, 
at his lips for him to take. The only common courtesy, if you can call it a common courtesy, or consideration that the Romans had was to give somebody who was being crucified a mixture which was wine and myrrh. It was supposed to be some kind of stupefying mixture that would relieve the pain and just basically put them in la-la land. But we know the scripture says the Lord refused to take that. He wouldn't have it. The reason being, he wanted his full faculties about him. He wanted to know exactly what was happening. And he wanted on that occasion to be sure that he was in complete control and complete awareness of everything that was happening. And so on that cross, at noontime, something began to happen. And the Lord cried out for the first time, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God could not look upon sin. And in that moment, our blessed Lord had all of the sins taken on him for all of the world. And so something interesting happened. The scripture says that Jesus made this statement that it, when everything had been accomplished and the scripture had been fulfilled, or what had been accomplished, I tell you what, the plan that God had for the penalty of the sins of men to be paid, the Lord could say at that moment, it is finished, it's been done. And the prophecy that was fulfilled, read it, be, please be sure to read this. In Psalm 22, in Isaiah 53, you read those words and you hear our Lord telling the world over and over, that is exactly what happened to me. But something else happened when noonday became midnight. Our Lord did something that would, out which our salvation would not have been complete. He spent three hours in a place where God was not. For the first time ever, and the last time ever, he was in a place where God was not. He went to a place, and I'll tell you what he did. He paid the penalty. He paid all of the penalty for all of the sins, for all of the men, for all of eternity. That's how much he suffered in those hours. And you want to know, we want to know, why would he say, I thirst? There was a man, a rich man in hell, and he said, I would love to have just the tip of my finger to be moistened that I might touch my lips with it. And we wonder why our Lord said, I want, I'm thirst. But he wasn't asking for water. And he wasn't asking for comfort. I'll tell you what he was asking for. The scripture says that our Lord's next statement is, it is finished. And I'll tell you why our Lord wanted that moisture. The scripture says in Psalm that the Lord says the pains of sin of hell have gotten hold of me. There is no question. He spent an eternity in hell compressed into three hours with all of the sins for all of the people for all of eternity. All of that is compressed into three hours. And that is exactly and precisely what he has endured on his body. But he's getting ready. He says it's been accomplished. The scripture says, and John wrote this, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The word propitiation simply means he is a satisfaction. God looks at him, and he is satisfied that the penalty for all sins, for all men, for all eternity, had been paid. And the scripture says, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And I'll come back to that a bit later. But for now, I want you to know that our Lord has a reason for saying, I thirst. The scripture is very clear. The psalmist said this, the tongue is cleaving to the jaws, to the roof of his mouth. 
The lips are parched. We think we know what it is to be thirsty. We think we know what it is to be somewhat thirsty or even very thirsty. We know nothing of what the Lord did that day. Not only that, but the changes that took place in his body or any body of a human being that was being crucified would take all of the liquid from his body. And so he had nothing, humanly speaking, from which to draw. But he's got a reason. He said he paid the price. He's getting ready to make an announcement. And so on that cross, with what broken body he has left, with what little bit of life he has left in him, he's getting ready to pull himself up. He's getting ready to get some air in his lungs. He's getting ready to moisten his lip to get his tongue moving enough so he can not say something. He's getting ready to shout something. He's getting ready to make a bold proclamation. He's getting ready to send a message to the whole world. And especially is he sending a message. He's getting ready to shout. And he wants the devil, he wants Satan to hear what he has to say. And he wants every demon in hell and even every demon on earth to hear what he's about to say. And what he's about to say is simply this. It is finished. It's finished. And it is simply another way of saying to Satan and to your demons, I won, you lost, deal with it. And the victory is ours. Make no mistake about it. The victory is ours. And it is ours to claim. It is ours to possess. And nothing this side of heaven or hell can ever change that. And our Lord that day went to a cross. And on that cross, he made a bold proclamation. And when he said those words, it is finished. It was in the Greek language, not three words, but one word. To tell us that it's over. It is done with. I have completed the plan of salvation. I have paid the price for your sin. Everything about it we owe to him. Jesus paid the price. Make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ paid the price and he paid it in full. And so from that cross, he got enough energy and enough got enough movement and he got enough freedom in his mouth to make that statement. It is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There will be no more war. It is finished. The end of all conflict. It is finished. And Jesus is Lord. And that's what he said. And nothing and nobody has ever been able to change that. And nobody's ever been able to challenge that. And so I want you to know today, if you're here and you never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you're listening by Facebook or YouTube, and you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, you have never received Him as your Lord. As our worship leaders come and prepare for this invitation, you can do that now, but you're not going to be distracted because I want you to hear what I'm about to say. It's okay. The worship leaders can come. But I want to tell everyone today who has never trusted the Lord as their Savior, hear this, hear me well, and hear me now. It is not easy to go to hell. You say, well, it certainly is. All you've got to do is reject the Lord. No, it's not that simple. It is not easy to go to hell. And I'll tell you why. Because on the road to hell, you've got to climb over the blessings of God. You've got to push aside the goodness of God. The scripture says the goodness of God leads to repentance. It certainly ought to, but it doesn't always do that. On the road to hell, you've got to ignore 
the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts and in the world. He's making a statement every way and every day. I love you, I love you, I love you. On the road to hell, you've got to push aside the grace of God. You've got to trample on the grace of God. The scripture says, don't shun, don't step on the grace of God. And in order to go to hell, you've got to do exactly that. And so it's not easy to go to hell. I'll tell you what is easy, to not go there, to trust the Lord as your Savior, to invite Him into your heart, to realize that our blessed Lord spent six hours on the cross and He uttered seven words in that course. And He did that for one reason and one reason only. He didn't do it for show. He didn't do it for popularity. He didn't do it in order that people would ooh and ah, what a, oh, what a man, what a man. As a matter of fact, they even tortured him, they tempted him, saying, if thou be the Christ, come down from the cross and we will believe you. Well, let me tell you, he did not come down from the cross. And if he had, he would never have saved a single soul. He would have stayed on the cross and we would have stayed in our sins. But he didn't come down from that cross. He stayed there. He paid the price. And he paid it in full. And because he did, now it's so easy to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. And hear this. The one who said, I thirst, is the one who offers you the living water because he is the living water. And he says, anyone who will come to me and drink of this water will never thirst again because you will be satisfied. You will be satisfied. And more than that, God will be glorified. You could touch off a celebration in heaven today by trusting Christ as your Savior, inviting him into your heart. Because the said, scripture says, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels over one who gives their heart to the Lord. Who's doing the rejoicing? None other than Jesus Christ. He'll be the one who'll celebrate today if you give your heart to him. But make no mistake about it. You say, what can I do to be saved? Strictly speaking, you can't do anything. This is the works that you must do. You just believe. Jesus Christ has done it all. He's paid it all. All you have to do now is believe and receive. And when you do, your life will change for all time and eternity. And only because Jesus Christ has paid the price. I said to you a bit ago, I was going to come back to a scripture, and I'm doing that now in closing. John said, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. I want to tell everybody who has never trusted Christ as your Savior, as John Hagee says, hell's still there and you're still going whether you agree with it or not, whether you think so or not. But it doesn't have to be that way. And the tragedy of it is, it doesn't have to be that way. You can change that, because everything that needs to be done has been done. The scripture says, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. This is the heartache and this is the heartbreak of every person who goes out of this world without Jesus Christ. It didn't have to be that way. Jesus Christ has paid the price for the sins of all people. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And every person who winds up in a place separated from God. And by the way, the Lord spent three hours separated from his Father, which seemed like an eternity. And for those who go there, it will be an eternity. Make no mistake about it. And so you need to know, you're going to have an eternity to know it didn't have to be this way. The price had been paid, and all I had to do was accept the gift, and I could be with my blessed Lord.
I could be with him. I'm going there. I'm going to be with him. And I'm going to tell you today, that shout is still going out throughout the world. It is finished. It is finished. As we stand, as we sing, this is your moment. I don't assume anything about anybody. I ask you, if you've never given your heart to Christ, now is the acceptable time as we sing. about the beauties of Easter and the resurrection of our Lord, but we dare not ignore the cross. We have to understand there's a cross before the crown, and I trust that uh, today has given you a new appreciation uh, as a reminder of what Jesus Christ did and how much we owe to him because without him, we wouldn't have the victory that we do now. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, for the privilege and the honor of being in your house. Thank you for the greater privilege of being in your family. And that's made possible only because our Lord did what he did, and our Lord gave what he gave. And we just must be reminded that the door is open the invitation is extended to whosoever will that they may come. How it grieves us to know or to think that there may be some who have not accepted that invitation. We have to keep praying, we have to keep preaching, and we have to be, 
continue to proclaim the goodness and the grace of God in order that day by day the population of heaven will increase by the numbers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. dismissed. Thank God for the cross of Calvary. Thank God for the cross of Calvary. Amen. Amen.